one of the things I love most about Christmas is seeing all the decorations. I like to drive around at night. Somebody do that. I like to drive around at night to see the lights and everything and the way that people have their homes and yards decorated. I especially like the nativity scenes. We don't see so many of those anymore. I, I brought one for you to see. It's on the screen. Our nativity scene. There it is. Do you notice these uh, characters in the nativity scene? I'm not going to argue the theological correctness of it where the wise men there when the, when the shepherds were there. That doesn't really matter. <laughs> what matters is that there are a lot of different characters there. Who are some of the people that you see there? What are some, who are some of the characters? Somebody tell me. What is that? Well, the baby Jesus is there. Anyone else? The angels are there. It's like one's blowing a trumpet. Anyone else? Shepherds? And of course, the wise men are there, aren't they? But out of all these characters, there was one, perhaps no one was more important other than the Lord Jesus himself. One was, was so important that without it, we might not even have a Christmas story. I think God would have found another way, but it's Mary. It's this young woman, Mary, the mother who bore the Son of God. Now, I know Mary was not superhuman. She was not perfect. She was a sinner just as all persons are born sinners. And she had to accept Jesus as her Savior just as all do who want to have eternal life. Nowhere in Scripture is Mary worthy of our prayers or our worship. And yet she is so very special. She is special because she is the one woman in history whom God chose to carry and give birth to his son. Just think, there were many other women on earth that day. But God chose the young Jewish woman, Mary, to introduce himself and his salvation to the world. What we see in Mary is she waited for the coming of the Messiah is an example for all of us today who are waiting for the coming of the King. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1 as we continue our study of the Christmas story and those who are waiting for the King. Luke chapter 1. Would you stand with me as we offer the reading of God's precious and holy word? Beginning in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name, and what is that name? Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And, then, and the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. And then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's stop with that as we seek the Lord in prayer. Father, we are praying again. We have praised you now. And we are praying that, Lord, even now you will take your word. And you will touch hearts with it. That would be my desire. It's always my desire, Lord. That your word would be spread, that it would be preached and taught and delivered throughout this earth as we get ready.
bids for your return. I believe you're coming back, Lord Jesus. And when you come, when the trumpet sounds, I will be preaching, I will be teaching, I will be sharing your precious word. Because this is the truth, Lord. It's the only way we can know how to please you. It's the only way we can know how to be saved. So, Lord, I pray that uh, today your Holy Spirit would take your word, and from this word we might apply it to our lives and learn how we might follow you and serve you and bring blessing upon us and our families. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do. Waiting for the team. Well, throughout history, there's never been a woman honored more by men than Mary. And this is seen even in the fact that her name is given to more little girls, has been given to more little girls in history than any other name. I did a little research. And according to the Social Security Administration, over the last hundred years, the name Mary was used most frequently in, uh, over the last hundred years, it, it was the most frequently used name for women in 43 of the last 100 years. In fact, from 1900 to 1961, Mary was the most popular man in America in all the six of those years. And yet today, the name Mary has almost fallen off the charts. It, it is at a low rank of 112 now. If you look at a chart, and I've got on the screen for you, of how the, the name Mary has been given to children, it kind of looks like this. It was number one from 1880 to 1961, except for just a few years when Linda came in. I read on the internet, but then it plummeted to 102 in, 19, not, uh, in 2009 and 112 in this year. I read an article, internet article entitled, Why Parents Don't Name Their Daughters Mary Anymore. And according to this writer, he wrote, he said, In absolute numbers, the number of girls given the name Mary at birth has fallen 94% since 1961. The modernization theory of name trends, advanced most famously by the sociologist Stanley Lieberson, sees the rise of individualism in modern naming practices as the role of the extended family, religious rules, and other institutional pressure declines. He wrote, choices are increasingly free to be matters of taste. Mary, both a traditional American name and a symbol religious, of religious Christianity embodies this dream. Could it be that the decline of Mary as a popular name in America could somehow be linked to the decline of Christian belief in America? Could it be? It's possible. But, but it really is a recent thing because you see in all of history that name Mary was the most popular name, not just in America, but around the world. The English name Mary is a transliteration of the Greek name Maria or Miriam, which in turn is a transliteration of the Hebrew name Miriam. And besides that, there is there are other variations of Mary, like Mary Ann, Mariah, Marie, Maria, Mia. And for boys, Mario, Marion. You see, the name Mary has been the most popular name in history for naming children. And yet, when we look at Mary in the Bible, we don't see a grand figure here. We don't see a woman of power. On the contrary, in Mary we find a frightened little girl who was called upon by God to do an enormous task, to be the mother of God, the eternal son. Did it require courage? Oh, yes. And much more. Though she was young and insignificant to the people of her day, her faith was astounding as she was actually called upon to bring God's salvation to the world. Let's look at our text and see what Luke tells us about Mary. First of all, when we, when we look at the account in Luke 1, we see a young Jewish woman who was, like all the Jews, waiting for the king, waiting for the coming 
of the Messiah. And we know this because in verses 54 and 55, Mary said, he, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy and as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Mary was referring to God's covenant with Abraham. When he called Abraham, he said, Abraham, get out of your country, from away from your kindred, go to a land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that's a reference to the coming Messiah or Savior. The only way the, the whole world can be blessed is through Jesus. God was giving Abraham a promise that the Messiah was coming through him. Jesus would come through the seed of Abraham, through the sins of Abraham. Jesus would come through the sins of Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, as God kept giving the, the cup, passing the covenant down. Jesus did come, and he was born a Jew, and he died, and he lived according to the Jewish law, and kept it off. He was the only man who had ever kept it off. And then he died as a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, so that whosoever would believe in him, whosoever among all the nations of the world, whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Mary was waiting for the king to come, and therefore she understood the meaning of Gabriel's message and the importance of God's call to her. And therefore, when we look at Mary, we see a lesson for us who are waiting for our king's return. Notice with me, when I look at the life, this account of Mary and her young life here, I see that as we wait for the king, we need a faith that is willing to accept God's plan. Look at verses 26 through 33 with me. It was the sixth month. Yet in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, blessed for you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was, and then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name. What was his name? Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Luke begins the story, Mary's story in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, while Mary was while Mary was still at home in the little village of Nazareth. Nazareth was an obscure village, nestled in the hills about 500 feet above the plain of Israel on the side on the side of Galilee. When Philip brought Nathaniel to Jesus later on, you know, Philip the, and the, the apostle and Nathaniel, when Philip brought Nathaniel to Jesus, Nathaniel, who was also from Galilee, he was from Cana, said to Philip, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth did not have a very good reputation. Later in Jesus' earthly life, he visited Nazareth. And what did he find there? He found that the people would not accept him. He found that there was so much unbelief, he could hardly do any miracles and help anybody because they were just opposed to him. Nazareth was an unlikely place for the king of kings to live. And yet that is exactly where Gabriel found Mary. Mary was at the time very young. She was betrothed or engaged to Joseph. Now, in Bible times, marriage consisted of two distinct stages. The engagement or the betrothal and the marriage itself. Engagement involved a formal, formal agreement in, initiated by a father seeking a bride for his son. That agreement would be made with the father of the bride. The father of the groom would make an agreement with the father of the bride. The father of the groom would pay a sum of money to the father of the bride with a written agreement. And then the son was drawn in and he would take an oath to keep that agreement made between the fathers. The engagement was legally binding. And any physical relationship by the daughter with another man 
was considered adultery. The engagement could only be broken through divorce. And the bride and groom were treated as husband and wife in the, in the eyes of the people around them. The normal age for a girl to be engaged to a man was 13 years old. And so Mary was a young girl indeed, just barely in her teens, when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. And how did Mary respond to God's messenger and God's message? How did she respond to this visit from the angel Gabriel? She responded in faith. And in fact, that's how our faith is seen, is in our response to God. Notice with me, faith is seen in our response to God's call upon our life. Notice how Mary responded to God's call upon her life. First, she responded with humility. Now, the, her first response was in the form of a natural reaction. We see it in verse, in verse 29. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Now the Greek word that Luke used here, remember the New Testament was written in Greek. Greek was the language of the day. Jesus spoke Greek, all the disciples spoke Greek. They spoke Hebrew also, but they, spoke, they used Greek as their ordinary language. And they wrote in Greek, and Luke wrote in Greek. And the Greek word that Luke used here for trouble is a little more intense, a whole lot more intense than the English word trouble. What literally Luke is saying is, when Mary saw him, she was all shook up. That's what she said. That's what he said. Uh, he shook up. Let me ask you a question. If uh, you're sitting in your living room, sipping on your iced tea, and all of a sudden, this huge, powerful angel appears to you while you're sitting there, and stands between you and the TV and says, Hail thou who are highly favored. Would you be troubled or would you be shook up? <laughs> I think. <laughs> so this word, when Gabriel said that, she was shook up. You better believe it. She was shook up. Of course, we don't say, Hail thou. Anymore, do we? We say, hello to you. That's what we say. That's the, and you know, hail turned into the English word now, hello. And we say, hello. And that's what Gabriel said. He didn't come in thundering like, you know, with a booming voice to try to frighten out of his. But just the fact that he was there and he addressed her that way shook her up. And he said, hello to Mary. Hello, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. He said, Ho, curios, meta, su. That's the Greek. Ho, curios, the Lord, meta, su, with you. Wow, what a comfort. Wow, what strength there is in these words. When the Lord called Moses from a burning bush, could go toe to toe with Pharaoh, the, the king of Egypt, the most powerful man on earth. And he said, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and I'm going to give you, give you a message. And you tell him, let my people go. And then you lead that lead many people out of bondage into the desert. And I'll tell you where to go. When Moses said, Moses was shook up. And Moses said, how can I do this? And do you know what God said? I will be with you. When God called Gideon, to gather an army and defeat the Midianites. And Midianites had about 30,000 men, and here came Gideon, he gathered all his men, and God said, send them all away, just 300 Gideon is all you will need. And Gideon said, how can I ever do this? How can I save Israel? You know what God said? I will be with you. When, how many times in my, in my life have I faced these troubles and trials that I've faced? Faced my own obstacles, faced my own enemies, faced my own weaknesses, and I've asked the Lord, how can I ever get through this? And the Lord somehow has said to me, I will be with you. And God does not just tell us, God shows us that 
He is with us. Before He ascended into heaven, the Lord Jesus knew that after His disciples witnessed the crucifixion, after He died that horrible death for the sins of the world, after He rose from the dead, after He ascended into heaven, they were going to be all shook up. And so Jesus said in John 14, 18, to them and to us today, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Of course, we know how he comes to us, don't we? Through the power of his presence in the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that fills our lives and gives us the strength to get through. Amen? And this is what Paul said. He said, I, he had, listen, Paul had been shipwrecked, he had been beaten, he had been dragged out of the city, he had been left for dead, he had been He'd been in prison, and you know what he said through it all? He said, I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. Gabriel said, Hello, Mary. The Lord is with you, and he has shown favor on, upon you. That word favor is the same root as the, as the word grace, charis. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Mary is not seeking God's call when Gabriel appears. Mary is only waiting for her king to come, just like the rest of the Jews. They, she thought the coming of the Messiah was going to be with grandeur, with pomp and ceremony. That God was, that the Messiah was going to come down with a sword and defeat all of their enemies, and it was going to be so, such a powerful experience. She did not have any idea that the coming of the king would be in the form of a little baby. And neither did she have any idea that she would be part of it. But God chose it. Out of his own free will, God chose it. God, Gabriel even made it clear in his reading that Mary was not blessed above women. She was blessed among women. Dr. Darrell Bach, a great theologian, said, Mary did not ask for or seek this role in God's plans. God has simply stepped into her life and brought her into his service. Her asset is that she is faithful. She should be honored for her model of faithfulness and openness to serve God. But that does not mean she is to be worshipped. Luke warns us to identify with Mary's example, not to unduly exalt her person. Mary's not seeking recognition here. She's just barely a young woman thrust into an adult world and and now given the greatest assignment ever given to any person. Remember, she's about 13. She's engaged to a man. And her, her marriage was arranged by her father. Can you imagine this now? She's 13. I don't even know if we have any 13-year-old girls here. Do we have any 13-year-old girls? Imagine what this is like. She has never been with Joseph. She doesn't know anything about marriage. And now... She doesn't, certainly does not know anything about having a baby. Maybe she had been around, I don't know if she had been around or not, but this was different than any other birth. She was going to be the mother of God's son. And so we see her second response. In verse 34, look at it. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? Here we see her innocent and humble spirit. How can I do this? She asked. How can I have a baby? I'm not even married yet. Luke makes, Luke makes it clear that Mary is a virgin. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is very important to God's plan of redemption. Jesus had to be born of a virgin. He had to. He could not be the son of Mary and Joseph. If he were the son of Mary and Joseph, he would have inherited all of their sin nature. Jesus was Mary's son. She had a sin that. But Jesus was God's son. And he was divine. And because he had the divine nature, he could resist the sin nature. And he could overcome it. And he could then live above sin and die as a sacrifice for all of us who are slaves to it. Who have fallen prey to our sin natures. He had to be God. So that he could die as a divine sacrifice for our sins. Mary reiterated, she said, I have never known a man. The question, this some people say, well, she wasn't a virgin, that's impossible. With God, 
all things are what? Possible. To question the virgin birth of, of Jesus is to make Mary out to be a liar. And it's to make God out to be a liar as well. Because for 700, because 700 years before his miraculous birth, God said to the prophet Isaiah, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is the Hebrew word for God with us. Jesus was born of a virgin so he could literally be God with us. Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but she had not consummated the marriage. In fact, this was forbidden until the wedding day. So Mary is not refusing God's call. She just simply wants to know, how can I do this? And the angel Gabriel gave the answer. Verse 35. He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One that is to be born will be called the Son of God. And now indeed Elizabeth, your cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called Mary. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And then Mary said, Behold, the handmaid, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Mary humbly accepted all that God had in store for, for her. And God would be pleased with that humble obedience. The Lord loves for his people to humble themselves before him. He tells us in his word, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Isn't it interesting that Mary was a young, humble woman, but her child was going to be the son of the highest. And would rule over the house of Jacob forever. It does not matter who we are or what we have done. God loves us and God wants to use us. He has called every person to join him as he works to redeem the world. He looked throughout the sea of humanity to find that one person who he could use to bring in the redemption of the world, to birth a child, his only begotten son. And he found faith in a little village. A tiny little village and a very young little woman found faith, a big faith in the heart of this young teen called Mary. Remember more than anything, God calls and blesses those who are humble before Him. I love what the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 66. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is this house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? In other words, God said, you can't build a house that's fixed up the whole me. Now, all these things have I made. I have made the universe. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. And I am so big that the universe cannot contain me. I'm above all of this. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. James the half-brother of Jesus said, was, James was the son of Mary and Joseph, and James said, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, so humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. To humble ourselves before the Lord puts us in a position for God's help. When we are proud and we lift up ourselves, we have nowhere else to go but down. But when we humble ourselves before the Lord, we confess that He, we confess that we are weak and He is strong. When we humble ourselves, we confess that we don't have the answers. But He does. When we humble ourselves, we confess that we don't understand how things can get better, but He does. When we humble ourselves, we confess that He is all that we need. And that's what God wants to hear. How many of you have been at the end of your rope and then God came to your rescue? I've learned that often it takes getting to the end of our rope before we begin to exercise the humility and faith that God requires. It shouldn't be that way, but often our of a little bit delay and our unbelief fears our blessings. So God lets us get real low so we will look up. And God can do just that. I've ministered to people in jails and prisons, and one of the things I've heard many say to me was, Pastor God had to put me behind bars and take everything away from me before I would do what he wanted me to do. Just think, remember John, where God had to put him in the belly of a fish? The Old Testament prophet Micah said some powerful words. He understood what it really means to please God. And here's what he wrote in Micah 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with 
as a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborns for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God never calls us to do anything we cannot do, but God always calls us to be willing to do whatever He calls us to do. To have that kind of attitude requires humility and faith. Mary had both of those. And finally, not only did Mary respond with humility toward God, but Mary responded with honor toward God. After Gabriel left Mary, the very thing which he said would happen to happen. A baby began to form. Mary began to show her, show her pregnancy. Now, in Bible times, if a woman was betrothed and she became pregnant, she was guilty of adultery and the penalty was death by stomach. Imagine how Mary felt when that baby began to move within her. Was she happy? Was she afraid? Was she uncertain about the future? Ladies, you that have had babies, what were your emotions when that baby started, first baby started forming within you? I'm sure she was all these things and more. Remember, she was about 13. Ladies, imagine how it would have been for you if you had been 13 and you became pregnant with the Son of God. Can you imagine that? These emotions are intensified a million fold. So Mary, what does she do? She goes to see her cousin Elizabeth. Verse 39. Mary rose and in those days went to the hill country to taste the city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. She needed the support of her family. She needs support of someone older than she was. Aren't you glad God knows what we need when we need it? Amen. And aren't you glad God puts people in our lives during trying times to help us and encourage us? Parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and friends and the place we ought to find the most encouragement is among the people of our church. Amen. The church ought to be a place of encouragement and support. Some of you here have had hardship in the church. Gave help to you. Some of you have been sick. And the church ministered to you. We have such a great church. We have a loving family. I've never been a part of a church with so much of God in it. I'm so proud to be part of Calvary Baptist Church. And I'm, I'm glad we're a praying and giving and loving and supporting and witnessing church. And friends, there are people out there like Mary confused and frightened and uncertain about the future. And they need us. They may not know that they need us. So we have to go and have to reach them and we have to help them know the love of Jesus. We have to let them see that He is the King of our lives. He is the Savior who wants to save them. And He loves them no matter who they are or what they are or where they are. We know that when we're suffering, we can find support here. We need to show others the love of Jesus. Mary went to Elizabeth because Andrew Gabriel suggested He told Mary about Elizabeth. He said she is expecting for six months. Look at verse 41. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believes, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. How powerful. This little baby in Elizabeth was John the Baptist. And he, he, was, he was not, listen to me, this baby was not an insignificant lump of flesh. He was a baby filled with the Holy Spirit from his, from his conception according to the angel Gabriel. And here he is leaping when Jesus comes into his presence. Elizabeth says, you are blessed among women. That you are most blessed. You know, in Jewish thought, a woman's greatness was measured by the greatness of her children that she bore. No one was greater than the baby that was growing inside Mary. The greatness of Jesus was soon outshined the greatness of John. Mary was so blessed. And Elizabeth sang a song. And she said to Mary, For indeed, she said, Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Mary said, Elizabeth sang, Mary, you're blessed because... You have believed. And then Mary, I just pray, this song of praise, here's what she said before she said. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in, the God, in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maid servant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty and great things for me, and holy is his name. 
That's a personal praise from here. Do you praise God personally for what He has done in your life? You should. Personal. He's a personal Savior, a personal Lord, a personal Shepherd, a personal God. He deserves our personal praise and honor. And then Mary said, tells why she's praising. For He who is mighty done great things for me. Holy is His name. Verse 50. And now it's corporate. His mercy is on those who fear Him. From generation to generation he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly and filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. You know what Mary is saying? She's given a testimony to the king's might. God's arm is a symbol of his might. And with that, a king will rule the nations. And Mary may not have understood that but she was talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ the baby she was carrying would come again one day to rule this world and one day he will conquer all enemies. And notice finally what he's going to conquer. He has held this servant Israel, verse 54, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and his seed forever. One day Israel is going to be restored. Right now they don't even believe in him. But one day they will. One day they will look and they will realize that this Jesus, they will recognize him whom they crucified, is their Lord and Messiah, and they will weep. And Zechariah said in that day, Jehovah shall, the Lord shall defend around the people of Jerusalem, and it will be he who is people among them in that day shall be like David strong, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. He shall be in that day, I will seek God said to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and prayer, and they shall look on me when they have pierced. And they shall mourn for me as one mourns for his only son. And the bitter over me as the bitterness over the firstborn. Yes, the Lord Jesus will appear one day in the sky. Friends, he's coming back. Hallelujah. And when he comes back, every eye is going to see him and every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord and he is going to remember his promise to Abraham and to Israel. He promised Abraham that he would give Israel their promised land and he's going to restore them. He promised David the Messiah would sit on his throne and he will. He promised Mary that he hears the cries of the humble and he does. And so today, what will we do to prepare for the coming of the King? Mary prepared to be humble before the Lord and worshiping him. And we should do. Because that's what the blessings are. If you want to be blessed, then do what King Jesus is called when he calls. And when he comes, be found faithful. In December 1903, after many attempts, the Wright brothers were successful in getting their flying machine off the ground. First powered flight. The key off. Thrilled. They telegraphed this message to their sister Catherine. Catherine, we've actually flown, flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. Catherine hurried to the editor of the local newspaper and showed him the message. He glanced at it. Do you know what he said? How nice the boys will be home for Christmas. That's all. He missed the big point. A man has flown. Today many people are missing the big point of Christmas. What can we do to show them and help them prepare our hearts for the Savior of the world? How we prepare for the coming of the King? This Christmas do what Mary did. Listen to the Lord. Hear what He's saying to you with His Word and humbly accept what He has for you. All that He has. Look for ways to honor the Lord. Be a blessing to others. Don't discourage people. Encourage them to seek the Lord. And lift up your voice to the Lord. Love, worship. Let others know about the, how good God has been to you. Decorate your life with things that let them know about the true meaning of Christmas. That Jesus has come. He lives in you. Amen. Let's thank you. Our kids are out, eyes are closed. No one are just looking around. And I just ask a few questions. Does Jesus live in your heart? If he does, are you experiencing that sweetness of his presence? Are you are you having a good time with Jesus? Is he is he just so blessed to you? Is he just is he such a, a joy to be a part of your life? Is Jesus just 
revealed to you and first in you in your life today. Right now, would you just thank Him for His blessing? Thank Him for His presence, for all that He's done for you. What about you who do not know Jesus? You can't. Why don't you pray for Stephen and say, Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross and paid for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I'm sorry, Jesus, for leaving you out of my life. I ask you to come into my life and you can save me from you. Right now, Jesus, I accept you as my only Savior and I promise to live for you for the rest of my life. I pray that grace is the greatest day in the world for you in your whole life. On our welcome center, there's some books that will help you some literature that will help you grow in your faith. And if you'd like to talk to me, I'll be glad to talk to you. Maybe you want to join the church. As we sing in a moment, if you'd like to do that, we'll show you how to do it. I'll be glad to pray with you about anything. Father in heaven, whatever decision you need to be made, help us, Lord. Have our minds on Jesus always this week, this Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen.